This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, 
uh, device has evolved and now we have uh, narratives made of uh, many, many different uh, voices. Um, Vitaly Mox can uh, uh, experiment with the extent to which the template is realized, so they can explore the margins of the fuzzy set. Uh, <coughs> for instance, I think that the French new novel uh, deliberately got rid of character, plots, and all the things that make a narrative narrative, and really uh, uh, were interested in the marginal form. You can have pragmatic experiments, especially when you have a new medium. For instance, uh, nowadays we can combine games and narrative in you know, a way that we could not before the invention of uh, digital technology. Um, now with DPS technology, we can have the so-called uh, location-specific narratives that we can hear only uh, uh, close to a certain place. And of course, when you have uh, a new medium, then you are forced to, to adapt, uh, to create, to experiment, because you have to adapt your stories to the affordances of the medium. And so that's what we have to do with uh, digital technology. So as my title indicates, I'm concerned with the reception and cultural reach of digital narrative. The cultural scene is too easily conceived as an opposition between an innovative and daring avant-garde, which is inspiring, subversive, original, hard to hard work for the user, <coughs> in short, which is good for you, according to the saying, no pain, no gain. And uh, it contrasts with the uh, conservative a rare car, which is formula-driven, escapist, immersive, uncritical, predictable, and appears to lazy and timid minds. So I'd like to uh, throw away this uh, conceptualization and replace it with a three-way model. That looks like this. So at the bottom, we have a very large uh, area of hot zone where many people spend their vacation, and I call it the tropics. At the top, you have a very small and very cold zone which attracts only hardy visitors meager for solitude and adventure. This uh, And between them is a temple zone where you can, you won't see the crowds of the tropics, but you can spend a good time without the special training and special equipment needed from the North Pole. <laughs> So if you translate this in terms of uh, literary or narrative preferences, the topics is popular culture. Uh, the uh, North Pole is aggressively avant-garde experimental literature. And the Temperate Zone is serious literary author. And the people of the Temperate Zone are educated people who have a sense of, of style, have a, uh, uh, maintain a critical attitude, but they also like to be immersed in the story. They like a good narrative. Now I'd like to move to uh, the various kind of experimentation that you have uh, in Lavanda. So the first type of uh, experimentation uh, consists of literary movements with names that usually end in issues such as surrealism, dadaism, letterism, postmodernism, situationism. And these movements are collective phenomena. Uh, so they gather a large number of people. Uh, they pursue well-defined artistic and ideological goals, and they state these goals in manifestos, which often overshadow uh, their artistic practice. So when we no longer read the, the, the works, we still read the manifestos. And they are usually very uh, short-lived, because uh, their uh, uh, slogan is that uh, uh, art has to be constantly <coughs> new, so it will be replaced by the uh, next movement. The second uh, kind of experimentation is conceptual art. In contrast to collective movement, conceptual art is fiercely individualistic. While uh, collective movements aspire to create uh, uh, formulas that will produce a large number of works, 
conceptual art lives from the uniqueness and originality of its uh, generative formula. A good example of a, a conceptual uh, work that plays with the idea of narrativity is a, a text that is mentioned in almost all textbooks about uh, digital, digital culture. So it's not digital, it's composition number one by Matt Saporta. It's a book that was uh, printed on a deck of cards and uh, you shuffle the cards and supposedly you got a different story with every shuffling. But uh, what you really got was uh, various kinds of nonsense because stories, <laughs> stories rely on a very strict uh, se sequential order. And um, there have been a few imitations of uh, support in different languages, but not many because when you have conceptual art, uh, the interest uh, lies in the uh, uniqueness and originality of the idea. And it's an idea that's very easy to reproduce. So it was so easy to reproduce that it was not worth reproducing. So it created a whole school. Well, uh, artistic movements and conceptual art are clearly native of the North Pole. My short kind of experiment can take place in any of the reasons, and I call it simply innovation. Take, for instance, uh, the habit of telling stories like this, uh, comics <laughs> or graphic novels. That's certainly an innovation, but where did this innovation originate? It did not originate in the North Pole, it originated in the tropics in popular culture. And it was a, a long, considered low brow. I remember when I was a kid that parents were complaining that kids did not read good books anymore when they read where these were cheap uh, comics. But an innovation can, um, can rise from the tropic to another zone. And now this has uh, risen to the temporal zone when it has been reborn under the more uh, respectable name of uh, graphic novel. And there are even uh, uh, graphic novels that are staking claims on uh, the North Pole. You also have innovation that uh, starts at the North Pole and that perc percolates down to other topics. One of them is metalepsis. Metalepsis is a kind of uh, uh, transgression of ontological boundaries, and uh, it started in the uh, uh, experimental works, but now you find it in advertisement, in computer games, you find it everywhere. So if we look at the major narrative media of our time, namely print, film, TV, drama, they have all concord the tropics and the temporal zones, and uh, most of them have extended into the North Pole. Concording the temporal zone, in my opinion, is a prerequisite for broad cultural recognition. But digital narrative so far has been largely restricted to uh, the North Pole and the tropics. In the tropics, we find two types of narrative. We find uh, computer games, not all of them, but uh, uh, mostly uh, computer games, uh, uh, shooters, and uh, superhero computer games, things like uh, um, Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed that are based on a very strict narrative pattern which is the, uh, the uh, monomish of the hero as defined by uh, Joseph Campbell. So when you have a hero who, who uh, executes great tasks and, and climbs and uh, uh, TV concords, the, the boss, the meanest uh, enemy. And of course you have also there uh, social media narratives, which are really use social media not so much as a means of expression, but as a, um, a way of uh, communication, as a channel of uh, transmission. I mean, people use uh, social media like they use the, the mail or like they use the telephone to, to get a message through. <coughs> so um, we have the text of the topics, and what do we have at the North Pole? We find the vast majority what is officially recognized as digital literature. The texts uh, that are gathered on the website of the Electronic Literature Organization. 
Most of these texts are more interested in playing with signifiers and in turning language into a spectacle, and in telling stories so that you can summarize and that form a focus of attention. For this reason, most of electronic literature actually is not narrative, but it's much closer to a poet. The best known and oldest form of digital narrative is hypertext fiction. And that's a genre that presents many of the characteristics of a literary movement. When it was developed in the 19s, it was accompanied by the flourish of theory. Uh, um, uh, people would compare, uh, would uh, um, regard hypertext as a fulfillment of the ideas of uh, Foucault, Deleuze, Echo, and especially Barthes on so, such topics as intertextuality, rhizomatic organization, openness, self renewability and uh, the disappearance of the distinction between the uh, author and the reader. The hypertext mechanism of clicking on links to uh, activate uh, content remains the distincting, distincting, distinctive way of organizing and receiving uh, information on the web. But uh, as a way to organize uh, uh, literary text, it has really uh, died down um, after, uh, after the year 2000, because other, uh, other uh, characteristics of digital media have become uh, more prominent, such as the ability to, the multimedia uh, ability. So we don't find uh, the large hypertext that we had in the 90s anymore that were uh, based on a huge network that had thousands of uh, lexia. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, hypertext never uh, uh, dripped out the temporal zone is that uh, it cannot really create the um, narrative effect of suspense, curiosity, and surprise. And the reason it cannot is because these effects uh, necessitate lots of control in the sequence of information. But if, when you have a hypertext that's based on a very complex network, the author cannot predict in which order the reader will read the lexia, and therefore you cannot have uh, these uh, effects. So, as I said, hypertext is a sum of the characteristics of a literary movement. It was practiced by a number of different authors, and it was accompanied by theoretical claims that strongly resembled a manifesto. But the North School of uh, this narrative also contains a number of purely conceptual texts. Another example of uh, conceptual uh, electronic text is Agrippa by William Gibson. That was uh, a novel that erased itself as you read it. And I mean, that's something that would be easy to imitate, but uh, nobody has done it because once it has been done, it doesn't make no sense to do it again. Another uh, example that seems to be a favorite of, uh, of critics is uh, oh, this text, uh, The Jew's Daughter by George Morrissey. I think it's uh, 2001. So it's a text that looks like a narrative. It resembles a modernist narrative. There's a narrator, there are some pronouns, so the pronouns would not refer to, to, to characters. There are verbs, so maybe there's some action. But it's really impossible to say what the story is about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you see that there is a, a word in blue, and this is a link. There's a one link per page. <coughs> and if you uh, uh, mouse over that uh, uh, word, part of the text re uh, replaces itself. And so that's what you get. And uh, it's very difficult to know what is new and what is old, because the new part fits syntactically perfectly into the old part. And you don't have photographic memory, so you don't remember what you have seen before. So uh, it's almost impossible to read. Uh, here I have cheated because it doesn't allow you to see two pages at the same time. That's so why I did a screen capture. So uh, the part in blue is the part that is new, and the part in white is the part that is the same. 
So all of these conditions, it's impossible to read uh, this text as a narrative because you don't know uh, what is the sequence of events. You don't know what comes after and what comes before, since uh, part of the page is new and part of the page is uh, old. And when there are 608 pages like that, <laughs> I doubt that anybody has read uh, uh, this book in its entirety. <laughs> but that's an idea that would be very easy to imitate. Any of us could, could write something that uh, works like that. So that's, again, an idea that is not worth repeating because it's uh, it's too easy to do, but for the first time, it's interesting. And I think that what John uh, Morris wanted to do, he wanted to create a page that was dynamic, that constantly uh, changed itself. So that's an, an example of uh, conceptual art in digital media. So how can digital text negotiate a path to the temporal zone? Without, without giving up on the resources of the medium, so without uh, reducing their digital support to being uh, some kind of a Kindle machine, but uh, while retaining a narrative structure. I assume that for an artistic text to conquer the temporal zone, it must present a reasonably high degree of narrativity because narrative captures what interests people the most, namely the life experience of their fellow humans. Therefore, my question is really, how can digital technology contribute to narrativity? But first of all, we must ask, what are the specific resources or affordances of uh, the computer uh, that distinguishes it from other narrative media? The answer to this question is, at the same time, singular and plural. Uh, the main uh, property of uh, computers is that they are uh, uh, codable machines. And uh, so there is always code between the text that you see and, uh, uh, well, <laughs> and the computer, but uh, you don't see that code. And that code allows uh, the computer to do a variety of uh, things, and that, therefore it has a variety of, uh, of uh, properties, and no two uh, theorists agree on what are exactly the properties of digital media. If you read Janet Murray, if you read uh, Len, uh, Len Manovich, they have totally different lists of uh, properties, but all these properties are made possible by this basic property to be programmable. So here I will uh, focus on three properties that I think are particularly relevant to uh, narrative, interactivity, multimodality, and networking. Could we argue that interactivity is not specifically digital, since you have ergodic text, uh, that uh, text that offer choices to the reader that are in the print medium, text that, such as composition of the world or the choose your own adventures uh, stories. But I think there is a major difference between uh, the multiple choice print text and the kind of user activity that the computer makes possible. In a print medium, the text does not know what the user is doing, it has no memory. And the choices it offers to readers do not alter the text. So it's not the text that goes to page 33 in the choose your own adventure, it's the reader who turns the pages. But when you are in a digital medium, the text or the system knows what the reader is doing. It remembers what the reader is doing. And therefore, you can take a uh, make decisions that are conditioned by decisions that you made long before. That is uh, something that happens a lot in computer games. Uh, so uh, the, the system knows something about you, but uh, a regular print text does not know anything about you. So uh, the system can modify the global state of the story world on the basis of the user's decision, and it can even evaluate the player's performance. And that's a, a feature that is specific to computer games. And many people regard this 
Have you seen the computer to judge the player's uh, performance as a distinctive feature of, yeah, of uh, video games? Because when you have a, a game of chess uh, played by a, a human, it's the other human who tells you if you are cheating and who is winning. But when you play with a computer, it's a computer who, who judges you. And uh, this can be very annoying, for instance, when you go to Amazon and uh, they make uh, all sorts of suggestions, and so they know something about you and you have the impression of spying on. This is this ability of computer system to, to have a memory and to know what you have done in the past. And this, uh, this ability is being used to some degree in hypertext, not, not much. For instance, uh, the hypertext of the 90s had a feature called guard fields. And when you had the guard fields, it, uh, it meant that you could only visit a node when you had visited a certain number of other nodes. So that was an example of the memory of the system. But uh, most of them did not really uh, make use of that uh, memory feature. Thanks to that uh, memory feature, maybe in the future we we'll have systems that uh, can dialogue with uh, the user, can remember what the user has said, that can maybe interpret the face of the user as a big field in co computing called affective computing where you can tell the, the emotion of the user by reading his face. Uh, so therefore, more and more computers will be able to know who you are and maybe to uh, create narratives in real time uh, on the basis of this knowledge. But this is for the future. Right now, uh, they cannot do that and uh, it's very difficult to have a, a dynamically generated uh, narrative. Usually most uh, computer games rely on, uh, on a fixed storyline and the differences between uh, various games is how fast you progress along this line or uh, how you solve certain problems, but the, the plot is not generated uh, dynamically. There have been a few attempts to develop highly interactive systems that simulate interpersonal relations. For instance, Michael Matthias and Andrew Stern have this, uh, created this uh, interactive drama facade where you, you dialogue, it's not driven by a menu, you really uh, uh, invent uh, your terms, you dialogue with the system and it's supposed to create a slightly different narrative every time, but this system is very deficient, uh, quite often they are non sequiturs, you, you can uh, see that the system doesn't understand what you are uh, saying. But this is the first step in a generation of story, a dynamic generation of uh, story. So, um, since they cannot uh, uh, generate stories in real time, so computer games uh, uh, rely on a fixed so story and also one problem with making computer games narrative is that the repertory of actions that you can perform with a computer is very limited. You can have menu, uh, a, a menu that says, uh, well, you are the, the avatar and you are going to say something to the non uh, character, so you get a choice of uh, what you can say. And with menus, you can do just about anything. But it's a, a, a menu is always an interruption of uh, the game. What you can do without interrupting, that you can do in the the time of the game, you can move along the story world, you can pick up objects, and you can use these objects. These objects are mostly weapons. So with this uh, repertory of actions, there are not many stories that you can tell. It's very difficult to have interpersonal relations with the uh, characters of the computer game. So uh, computer games make up for that with what is known as cinematic cut scenes. And uh, if there is an elaborate plot in a computer game, it is during the cut scenes that it is uh, presented to the player. But uh, this presents a problem because you have to balance the moments of action and the moments of uh, when you watch the cut scenes. And, um, 
So it's very difficult to achieve a satisfactory uh, uh, combination of these two elements. If a player is primarily interested in gameplay, and, uh, that is in solving problems through live action, then the cutscenes are allowing interruption, just like the intermission negotiator. You don't do anything to But if you are interested in the plot, and you have to perform action to get to the next cutscene that gets more of the plot, the, the actions are often very difficult to perform, and they are perceived as annoying roadblocks. So, uh, you can have a, a narrative in computer games, but there is always a give and take between uh, gameplay and narrative. So my uh, assumption is that users of the temporal zone will be primarily interested in the game narrative, and that they do not want overly uh, difficult or time-consuming tasks. In an interactive narrative of the temporal zone, focus will be on the story, and interactivity will be an easy movement uh, through the storyline and through the story world uh, that would lead to uh, enjoyable discoveries. And an example of a uh, type of game narrative that uh, could fill in the gap between the North Pole and the tropics, I'd like you to uh, show an independent game uh, called Bash by uh, Mike, Michael Samin and Aurea have. The Pass is a retelling of the a fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood, and it explores the dark, symbolic subtext of the fairy tale, which is themes of adolescent sexuality, uh, uh, lurking danger, and curiosity for the forbidden food. So I'll show you uh, through some uh, screenshots how it works. Um, you choose one of six girls, here are uh, uh, three of them, they are of different ages, they have all different personalities, and the game tells you to go in the grandmother, grandmother house and to follow the path. But if you follow the path, you get too easily to grandmother's house and you get a message that says failure. The game wants you to, to wander in the woods and to get up. So that's what you do. <coughs> you wander in the woods and they do the same everywhere. You have really have a sensation of being lost. And it's, it's a very slow game, not much uh, happens. <laughs> <laughs> you turn around and you see the same trees for uh, several hours, but for minutes. And uh, it can be rather frustrating, but sometimes you see a light on the horizon. And the light on the horizon means that within the woods there is something different. There is a place within the space of the woods. And this place, has, there is a playground, there is a cemetery, there is a, a camp of uh, uh, foresters. Uh, so there are six places within the woods. And uh, this is where the girl will meet the wolf. And each girl has a different wolf, so there is a place that is meant for each girl. If you are playing this girl, you will meet the wolf, but if you play another girl, you will just see, see the ghost of the girl who met the wolf there. <laughs> and I'll show you a, a scene where uh, the girl meets the wolf. So this girl, she's about uh, 14, and she's eager to try the adult world, so she would love to smoke cigarettes. She arrives to the playground and she sees this guy and uh, she comes close and she asks for a cigarette. And after that, the, the skin goes blank. And next, she's lying on a penguin that leads to the other house, obviously hurt. It's raining very hard. She gets up. You make her uh, walk. She walks very slowly to the grandmother's house. And then she goes through endless hallways and she sees uh, strange uh, landscapes. And how much she sees of a grandmother found depends on how many objects she has collected in the woods. And you can hear the wolf howling. It's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, you arrive to a, to a final door and uh, 
when you open the drawer, you see a, a, a cut scene that is hard to interpret. I think I, I interpret it as being her last thoughts as she's being attacked by the wolf. And after that, you get your score. I got nothing better than a C because I never got enough things in the woods. And then you play another game. So uh, this is uh, the patch. So my suggestion that uh, the patch offers a pass into a separate zone rests on several features. First, you have a user-friendly interface, just use the arrow keys. You have a non-competitive framework, the point is to explore the world, not to defeat enemies. You have beautiful graphics, you have haunting music, the soundtrack is really wonderful. Uh, you have, um, what else? Um, you have a nightmarish atmosphere, uh, and you have a simple but very suggestive uh, narrative, and also your game gives you a powerful sense of space and place. I mean, you, you move, you are lost in these woods, which represent space, but there are some places. Suddenly you see this light on the horizon, and you are so happy to, to finally reach a place that uh, that was to, uh, drives you through the woods. Of course, there is something uh, ambiguous about this game, because uh, your desire is to is to meet the wolf and to uh, uh, to see what happens when the girls uh, meet the wolf. But it also means the doom of the avatar. So you have to kill your avatar to, to win the game. So supposedly it raises uh, ethical uh, problems. <laughs> the second property of digital technology that can have a profound impact on narrative is the ability to transcode or existing analog, analog media into binary code and make them available on the computer. This transcoding your property turns computers into a meta medium or a delivery system capable of transmitting most, if not all, of the modalities of existing media. So we have text, image, sound, dialogue, and animation. And so uh, this results in a predisposition for uh, multimodality and transmediality. And I make a distinction between these two concepts. Uh, I call multimodal a work that is made of multiple types of signs that cannot be taken apart without destroying the work's total effect. If you have a, a comic and you take, take out the speech bubbles, then uh, it loses its ability to tell the story. Or, same thing with the film, if you take images away, then uh, you don't, uh, <laughs> you don't uh, get what's going on. Well, uh, transmediality is when you have uh, autonomous works of various media that converge toward the story world, and each of them presents a different uh, aspect of uh, this uh, story world. And there are lots of uh, works that are uh, um, branded transmedia, such as Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, where you have the film and the novel and the uh, gimmicks that you can buy. I don't call that this transmedia. I call this marketing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think to have transmedia storytelling, you really, uh, it, it's more than an adaptation. Each path must add something to uh, the whole. But I'm not going to, to go into this. I'm uh, uh, turning to uh, multimodality. And an example of a digital narrative that makes a very good use of uh, multimodality is Inanimate Alice by uh, Kate uh, Poulinger, uh, which is one of the very rare works on the ELO collection that uh, is really uh, a narrative. So I. Uh, I'll show uh, you a few uh, screenshots. So uh, Inanimous Alice uses uh, words, pictures, animation, and sound to follow the adventures of a little girl who her dad uh, works in the oil fields and he has to change work all the time. So she is exiled. First, she, uh, is first uh, episode is in China. 
Then you have Italy, Moscow, and then rural England. So she's off to the retirement. She has to adapt to a, a new environment every time. And uh, she has a, co a Facebook companion that's her player, which is an ancestor of the iPhone. And she has a good friend that uh, she has drawn on this uh, player that goes with her everywhere. So I'll show you a few. Uh, uh, this is a top player and uh, Brad. So um, I'm uh, showing you a few slides from the uh, episode where, uh, that takes place in England. She's 14 years old and her family has, has just been had to flee from uh, Moscow because her dad was involved in some kind of disaster and uh, she was wanted by the police and they have a day escape. And so he loses his job and they get to England. And uh, we ended up here in the town in the middle of England. I had no idea why my parents chose this place. Uh, and I think that for me the main theme of the, these stories is really how to adapt to uh, different places. And I think the, the uh, emotional importance of uh, environment plays a, a, a very important role in this uh, story. So in every episode, you see the floor plan of uh, the apartment where she lives. And you see a, a detailed account of, uh, of the room. So here is the kitchen. Of, uh, you can see that's not the, the most fancy uh, uh, kitchen. Here's another shot of the kitchen. <coughs> and I mean, when she was in Moscow, she was living in a rather fancy place, right? So compared to this dumpy thing. It's really a letter to get And uh, the house is upstairs and downstairs, they never, you have to, uh, how can I get rid of this? <coughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> few more. Uh, I think that uh, she sees beauty in in uh, this uh, decrepit environment, uh, like the weeds uh, that grow in the cracks of the pavement. And then there's uh, this episode where her friends dare her to climb to the top of uh, a building where she will, will have a beautiful view of the town. And uh, to me, it's symbolic of her. Um, uh, desire to adapt because uh, to build a mental map of the town is a way to uh, make herself at home. Well, some disaster strikes, the, um, the stairs break down, and uh, she, the user has to run a maze uh, to take her uh, out of there. Um, so I have to hurry. What I, what I was going to say is that. Uh, um, this is a, a story that can be enjoyed both by children and by grown-ups. And I think it's very much inspired by a children's literature. There's not too much text. Uh, in a children's book, you have uh, scans text and lots of pictures. And uh, I think that uh, this thing that uh, hypertext made was to have too much text, because it's very difficult to concentrate on a screen. I mean, books allow you a deep concentration that uh, 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 screens do not allow. So I think that you should minimize the text and uh, uh, maximize the other uh, types of sounds. <coughs> and uh, I think other uh, um, influences of children's uh, culture on digital uh, literature are things like um, Things like uh, advent calendars, pop-up books, activity books, and even treasure hunts. For instance, uh, augmented uh, alternate reality games are based on the uh, um, principle of uh, the treasure hunts. So I think that the children are a large part of the temple zone, and I think that uh, uh, digital. Um, Narrative should reconnect with uh, children. Uh, well, I have another work that uh, I wanted to discuss, but uh, I guess I don't have time. So I'll uh, uh, skip to the 
So in this presentation, I've taken a stand against the model that divides cultural production into an innovative avant-garde that boldly experiments with new forms, and a rare garde that either hunkers down in its own traditions or that blindly follows the lead of the avant-garde. As we can learn from science, it is in the nature of experiments that some of them succeed and some of them do fail. In other words, many experiments are actually dead-end branches on a tree of narrative evolution. But we can uh, learn something from failure even uh, as much as we can learn something from success. So we, I'm not saying that these experiments were not worth undertaking. The image of the tree is often used to represent the evolution of bio biological species. But it does not work nearly as well with narrative as with uh, uh, biology, because uh, in a tree, the branches can never join. They cannot ne never uh, merge. But in uh, narrative matters, quite often, you have uh, genres that uh, are blended. Uh, and here I would quote uh, Thomas Pavel, early modern narrative culture emphasized the differences between subgenres, while later forms of the novel have a result of multiple attempts to blend these genres together. So we cannot represent narrative evolutions uh, on a tree. As an alternative to trees, I would like to propose a more dynamic metaphor of narrative evolution, and that's the image of the swarm. In a swarm of birds or insects, there is no designated leader. Any member of the group can take the lead for a while and then a drop to the back. Narrative evolution is not a coat that is pulled by the horses of the North Pole. It's not a load that is pushed from behind by the force of the tropics. It's much more a swarm of ideas that move back and forth between the front and the back. These exchanges are so complex that it's impossible to predict which bird will take the lead and where the swarm is headed. In fact, it seems to be constantly changing direction rather than striving toward the goal. Therefore, I make no prediction about the digital future of narrative except for stressing the importance of conquering the temple zone. Thank you.